Welcome, everybody, to the second episode of The Wolf Pack. Listen, we are super excited to be here tonight. It's like I've been saying, this content is for you guys. I mean, the listener, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to let you slide into our DMs, if you know what I mean. So The Wolf Pack, it's a bunch of guys getting together, just talking cards, talking sports, and this is going to be a little bit behind the scenes of what we do. So, you know, be ready chill but you're gonna get entertained and you're gonna learn some stuff on the way now really quick wanted to just announce everybody and we're gonna go ahead after i'm done announcing and they're gonna tell a little bit about themselves but you know we have my man down on the left hand corner we got dave sylvester from dj sports cars 86 all right he's a teacher yeah he's a teacher and he's gonna you know drop some knowledge and my man up there ken at uh sports card lessons another retired teacher and he's in the computer business right now. And then my man, Carmine Jemay, but I call him Jemmy because he's always wearing those nice outfits. You know, he'd be shining like a diamond <laughs> last time I seen him. So, and that's from Carmine's Cards. And of course, I'm Cousin Oz from the People's Mailman and uh, from Cousins Collectibles. And like I said, it's the four of us. The last time it was the other four. So it's our turn to go ahead and, uh, you know, drop some knowledge and have some fun. So Ken, tell us about yourself, man. Yeah, wow, what a great intro, Oz. Uh, I am Ken, sports card underscore lessons. I am uh, I'm a collector. I am a dealer at shows in the hobby, uh, and I'm a podcaster. So I have, uh, I come from three different lanes, three different lanes in the hobby. Uh, and and uh, with the podcast, I like just to bring everything I see. I try to bring lessons to everybody else. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping this is going to, this, that this, this podcast here, this wolf pack, we're going to all be able to bring it together. Sounds good. All right, Dave, go ahead. I'm uh, Dave Sylvester at DJ sports cards, eight, six. Uh, I'm a dealer as well. I do a lot of uh, shows here in the Northeast and um, got back into the hobby at the start of the pandemic. Uh, I'm in that camp where uh, I'm collected and, was uh, big into the hobby growing up through high school. Uh, it's kind of a 15-year hiatus, but um, with the pandemic, missed sports, wanted to reconnect with sports, and uh, got back into the hobby, and it's been a blast ever since. You know, the people I meet at shows from afar, um, you know, just, just being a part of, sh of shows and that whole experience has, um, has really been a blast the last couple of years. That's awesome. And so, Dave, you really don't do much on the content side. So is this has this been your first appearance or you've been on other podcasts before? Um, I've been on a couple others. I've <clears throat> I've been uh, on with Ken before. I've been on with Rob uh, before. So, um, yeah, just a couple so far. But I'm excited to, you know, be uh, on these episodes that we're going to be running going forward with the past. Sweet, sweet. I'm going to love hearing your perspective, you know, from the whole dealer aspect. And, you know, you got a lot that you want to bring to the table. So I I'm looking forward to that. And my man, the news and sports anchor, Mr. Carmine. Tell us about yourself, brother. Yeah, I hope my voice quality lives up to that, Oz. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm uh, in the media industry here in a local news station in Medford, Oregon. But I grew up in Westchester County, New York, which is crosstown from my co host on Crosstown Cardboard, Craig, at New York City Sports Cards. And uh, we were just talking with Ken on Ken's podcast, just about how excited we are for us coming together on the Wolf Pack. I mean, who would have thought uh, kind of a similar story to Dave getting back into collecting after 15 years off because of the pandemic, going through some old stuff that a little while later, we'd be coming together a bunch of guys through our love of sports and sports cards and having it grow into something much bigger where all of us, except Dave, although he's appeared on other podcasts, now have a podcast and uh, are coming together in the Wolf Pack and exchanging ideas and just having fun with uh, collectibles and pieces of cardboard. And now we're all buddies, you know, talking on yeah. a podcast together. So pretty fun. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So I'm Cousin Oz, the people's mailman, if you haven't heard of me. I'm from Cousins Collectibles with my other cousin, my real cousin, cousin Tony. And we started about a year ago, uh, just 
decided to hit the record button, didn't really know what we were doing, never had any experience, um, but we just knew we had a passion for collecting cards and we listened to all the count content out there and we were like, you know what, maybe, maybe we could do this. Let's, let's see what happens. Let's hit this record button. Uh, we'll probably be laughing about a week later after we get no listens, but you know, it was, it was worth a try. And here we are 70, 72 episodes in and uh, going strong and, and it's, it's been the time of my life. You know, it's like for so long, it almost felt like there was something missing. You know, you go to work, especially being a mailman, it's real monotonous. It's just take the letter, put it in, take the letter, put it in, you know, and just listening to a uh, podcast the whole day. And, you know, I was like, man, you know, maybe, maybe I could do this. Maybe a little bit of a release for me and, and, and something that I can just go ahead and, and try to connect with others. And that's what this hobby has been. It's, it's been the ability. It's not just about the cards. It's, it's grown and it's mushroomed in something so much bigger than that. And it's these relationships that we have with Ken, with Dave, you know, you know, obviously, like I said, retired teacher, teacher, you got a sports and news broadcaster, Craig, uh, you know, New York City sports cars, another teacher. And then mm -hmm. you have a therapist and Rob Gerard and then cousin Tony. I don't know what he does. I just know he he's he <laughs> scrolling, through, scrolling through eBay all day long and somehow manages to make money somewhere somehow. But he actually he works for uh, Goya Foods. Um, you know, he's a food salesman. And then he also does AAU tournaments up and down the East Coast. And then. um who else we missing? We got uh Shane yeah. Norton, yep. ESPN, behind the scenes. Like it's crazy the 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 group that we had and, and that we formed. So this is gonna be fun, man. And like I said, it's it's like the we're we're just bringing our DMs to the people, and we want to go ahead and we want to entertain and we also want to educate. So let's go ahead and get to the first topic. Um, so I want to dig deep, fellas. I want to get like behind the psyche of what brings joy to you in this hobby you know we all operate and we move differently in this hobby we have people that are just dealers we have people that just collect we have people that do a little bit of both we have people that collect vintage or hockey so on and so forth etc so we all move in, in different lanes but the main thing is it's, it's all the same hobby so I want to try to see you know what gets your juices flowing and you know what you do to take it to the next level when it comes to the hobby so I'm gonna start with you Dave first like what what does this hobby do for you, man? Yeah. So, uh, the hobby has been a blast the last couple of years. Like I said, getting back into it, uh, two years ago. Um, so I'm mainly a dealer and, um, unlike most collectors, a little different. I don't have, uh, don't have a PC. Sometimes when I tell people that they look at me like I have a third eye, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> what I get a lot of joy out of, um, in the hobby is you know, the whole process of grading. I do a lot of grading, um, you know, looking at where there are going to be margins where I can, you know, have a good value, um, you know, when I'm into something for not that much. Um, I enjoy that whole process. I'd compare it a little bit to, you know, like playing fantasy sports, uh, a little bit like um, the show American Pickers, you know, when they're uh, looking through collections and things like that and finding things um, that they know can, you know, or they, you know, they think have upside and, um, and potential. I would compare, um, you know, how I collect and go about things, um, you know, a little bit like that. Um, yeah, I do a lot of grading. I really enjoy that process. Um, I like prepping cards. I like just the whole process of grading. And first so let of me foremost, ask you, Dave, all, yeah, real quick about the grading aspect. So you are you one of the guys that you could just look at a card and you can tell, you know, exactly what a grade's going to be? Pretty much, are you good like that? Because I, I I suck at that. You know, I think some I, something's a gem in <laughs> ten and it'll come back a seven. You know, so can can do you have that eye? I do. I, 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 I like to think I do. I have, I have pretty good luck when it comes to that. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I prep the cards. I have the Kurtz card care prep kit. I use that. Um, Dave, I'm just going to, just, um, I'm just going to interrupt you just, to, just a minute. And I think this is going to help Oz out too, because I don't care. And you, you tell me this, I don't care how well you look at a card before you send that card in, you prep that card. And I think that's the biggest thing right? That that's the biggest yeah. difference of a card that's going off for grading is even if it's pack pulled, right? Yeah. You pull that right out of a pack and put it into a penny yep. sleeve and you want to send it off. I I've done this. I, the card has come back. I've given it to somebody else. They've cracked it. They've cleaned it. They sent it back and it'll come back a higher grade. So I think the prep of the card is probably the most important part than so, visually looking at it. So tell me real quick, what is the prep? You know, what do, what do you do to prep a card? Obviously, we're not trimming cards and we're not doing anything illegal, no, but no. there is a yeah, way no, to no. prep these cards to send the grade and to get the best possible grade. So what, what goes into that, man? 
Yeah. So a um, couple different things. So one thing, one method I've kind of adopt, adopted uh, with stickers, I, I'm big into soccer. So soccer stickers and things like that with a paper surface. Um, if there is any sort of minor stain on it, um, I use an aloe Kleenex and I lightly uh, wipe it down sometimes for 10, 20, even 30 minutes. And um, I've had good luck getting oh. rid of little stains like that. Yeah. And um, the hold on, um, hold on. let me write this down. Aloe, aloe Kleenex. Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. Aloe Kleenex. Nice. So that was just something that I kind of adopted on my own, trying it on a few, you know, low end items I didn't care about. And um, actually uh, an Mbappe sticker, it was originally a PSA six. Um, I did that and ended up as a BGS eight five um, after, wow. Yeah, using that method. So that was one of my exciting uh, grading stories um, when it comes to, <laughs> you know, cleaning and, and prepping cards. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things is um, you know, using microfiber cloth to wipe the cards down. Um, you know, any little fingerprint thing like any, any little thing like that can definitely, um, you know, hurt the surface subgrade um, in particular. So I think that's sometimes overlooked. Um, you know, even if, it, like Ken said, even if it comes right out of the pack, I think it is important still just to, you know, wipe it down with the microfiber and um, and do that. So, yeah, and is had good luck doing those. Sometimes there's like little sure. threads hanging off, like you know the the way the thing was cut. There might be a little thread here and there. Is there a way to like take those off, especially like older cards, like so that they're not just hanging when you send it to without you know destroying the card or or, or making it you know. Yeah, so there's a corner rolling um, tool. Anytime there's, you know, a little crease or, you know, slight uh, crease in the corner area, especially uh, there's a tool that can roll that down and and uh, make that more of a solid corner. So um, that's sometimes a little bit tougher to do, but yeah. um, the surface stuff is what I've had uh, pretty good luck in uh, when it comes to grading. And then so also in the hobby... Oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say, so what else besides uh, grading and, 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 you know, setting up at shows, what else gets your, your juices flowing, man? Yeah, just I making new friends, um, you know, not just from the shows, but from afar. One of my best friends in the hobby I've actually never met. We've been, I consider him a close friend, uh, two and a half years. We, we grade together. We do submissions together. Uh, we talk just about every day. Um, shout out to Drew from uh, Carol Wood Collectibles. Uh, he's down in Tampa. And um, yeah, just experiences like that. It, it's very cool. Just, you know, making friends from afar and not only at shows and um, yeah, just building relationships with, um, you know, who I consider to be close friends uh, from the mm -hmm. hobby. That's what yeah. I've gotten the most joy from for sure. So. so Carmine, come on, brother. We need something. Give, give me something. What, what makes, what makes Carmine tick? Well, I was, uh, well, we don't want to give that away. On <laughs> this is a sports <laughs> uh, podcast. No, just kidding. No, I, I like. Uh, I was. I was thinking while Dave was saying that his buddy is in Tampa. He's got the New England Atlanta Falcons score. You know, with Tom Brady leading that huge comeback. Yep. If you're <laughs> on the YouTube, and I'm like, wow, from New England to Tampa, just like Tom. I was thinking that was a crazy. Yeah, there you go. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Yeah, cardboard connection. So I was kind of <laughs> relating to what Dave said as far as the margins and like the challenge. I have all these cards and and what I'm into them for on these loose leaf sheets of paper if you're watching on the youtube <laughs> and uh, i cross them out whenever i sell or trade a card and then i put next to it what i sold it for and so i know basically how i'm doing and uh you know even even up to current day of cards that i have so i think the challenge of making some side money is a big uh big motivator big uh aspect of what makes me tick in the hobby and then you know making the friends and making the connections like with you guys that i would have never thought going back into cards and listing them on eBay that I would then actually make some friends through doing that. So um, the excitement of the challenge of making a little side money, reliving the nostalgic past of some of my favorite athletes through autographs or game used patches or old rookie cards that are pieces of history, like this uh, Jack Nicholas behind my shoulder here, this true rookie card uh, from 1971 and then the friends. So I think it's like, it, it's kind of a threefold with the making money, reliving the history with cool cards that you get to own, whether you own them for a lifetime or own them and then move on from them. And then the, uh, the friendship aspect too. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. and let me ask you just before I go. So, so you mentioned the making money part and Dave, I think too, this is, this is really a side hustle for you, right? 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So for you too, Carmine, like, like, like you're, you mentioned the money and I just want to know, like, are you here? Is this, is this something that you're, you're, you know, taking some profit out or is this just so you can reinvest into your own PC and your card? Yeah, I reinvest maybe kind of into a PC. The only thing I really PC is Nick's New York Knicks on card autos mm-hmm. like Trevor Ariza, Landry Fields, Porzingis, guys that a lot of people don't really care about <laughs> because these cards are too expensive for me to PC. You know, like it, it's just too much money for me to have locked up in like a $2,000 Jack Nicholas or a $5,000 Tiger Woods rookie autograph. But, you know, like that's just part of the challenge and the risk and the, the, uh, seeing if I could do it. I really like doing things to see, am I capable of taking this risk off of like the research that I've done or, you know, looking at card ladder comps and feeling out some of these cards that don't really have comps and then, you know, taking that leap and going for it. So like I'll piece like this Larry Bird flawless auto that's in my background here on the YouTube. That's in the PC right now, nice. just because I don't, I want to, have that away so that I'm not like itching and doing something crazy to where I have a foundation of things that I really like. And then I can say, okay, but these are flippable. And then everything, you know, I might like some cards more than others and and do like what Rob, our buddy sports card therapist says, put them in your case, but at a price tag that somebody's going to have to really want this. That's mm-hmm. it's, a, it's well above mm-hmm. comps and then move it. If somebody hits that target and then it's a win win because you make a big profit. So yeah, yeah it, I would say it's it's like 50 50 the sports aspect and the you know seeing if oh maybe we can make a little extra profit off this yeah yeah and Dave it's being your side hustle right I mean this is yep. this is I think and you can correct me if I'm wrong this generates income for you I'm sorry what was that Ken I said correct me if I'm wrong this generates income because you don't have a PC yeah. so this is income yeah. generating for you yeah oh wow yeah so um you know sometimes I take um you know, some of what I make, um, use it towards bills and things around the house. Uh, in the majority of it, I'm reinvesting it, trying to build up to bigger cards gradually over time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. And that's part of why I don't have a PC. I think just because kind of like what Carmine said, I, I don't want to have too much money tied up into, into things where I'm not using it, um, you know, to, to try to keep moving forward. But mm-hmm. it's, um, that's just my mindset with it. I know, um, you know, most have a PC, but it's, um, yeah, I, I feel like I get the same joys from the hobby. Um, you know, looking at margins, grading, mm-hmm. trading, um, all the aspects of being set up at shows for sure. Yeah. If you love what you do, it never feels like work. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so for me, um this whole hobby inspires me because to me it was a perfect storm, right? When you think of someone um who is retired, right? And and I still own a business, but really this falling into my lap, you know, through a close friendship with, with, uh, Rob, uh, who has become one of my closest friends. So this hobby has really brought, you know, my closest friend as well as all of you and everybody else in the hobby. Um, when you hear somebody, Oh, they, they're retired. You think like, they're home all day. Right. And they're, they're sitting up with their feet up or whatever, but this is, you know, I, I, and I have to say this, I was at a job where I was very lucky. It was job lottery and I was able to retire at a very young age. Uh, and, and I did a lot of things, right. So being able to come into this hobby, which is, you know, is the hobby itself is really self-rewarding, right? Because not only do you meet these people, but you go look for things and, and, and we're going to talk a little later about risk reward, right? But it, it, it's not like playing a lottery ticket or going to a casino, right? You're purchasing, you're getting something back, right? So when people say like, oh, you're, it's, you're taking a chance or all this other stuff. Well, you know, you take a chance on a lot of things, but when you're buying a card, when I'm purchasing a card, I'm still getting a card and I purchased it for a reason. And you hear people say all the time, well, if this went to zero, I'd be happy to have it. Well, sometimes you better be happy to have it because, you know, <laughs> it, things don't really work out. So, you know, you know, I, I, I guess a lot of things for me when I call it the, the perfect storm, because um, it allows me it gives me the thrill of the chase. 
right? The thrill of the chase of, of finding cards that I want. It lets me create, keep my business creative juices going by going out and setting up as a dealer or going out and walking shows and getting cards to put in my case. And it allows me to still, the thing that I love to do the most being a teacher, it allows me to kind of still be a teacher on the podcasting end of it. You know, so what, what I, when I was retiring, I thought to myself, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, I'm, I'm glad I have my business and I'm going to throw myself into it. And, and within six months, eight months, I was in this hobby and, and yeah, just, if you told me this, when I was retiring, this is what I would be doing. I'd say, oh, you're crazy. Now that I'm doing it, there's nothing I, I would give up. I'm not giving, I don't care what happens. I'm not giving any of this up. I'm, I'm a hundred percent in. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of how crazy that was too, Ken, when me and Craig were on your podcast recently, you know, talking about our podcast, Crosstown Cardboard and like how strange it is that two, but strange in a great way, two different generations of people can become friends through collecting. And I'm like, well, this is like another phase of life, you know, yeah. almost. I mean, it's really taken on a, a thing of its own with Ken after retirement and Oz, you know, you retired your entertaining performing career, <laughs> you know, younger, but now you got the, the intros and, you know, cousin Tony and the people's mailman. And you got these intros that you're channeling that creativity through yeah. that you mentioned earlier that it's just like, wow, what a cool outlet that kind of sprung up. That's now taken on a life of its own. Yeah. So, yeah. so Oz, besides being able to use your hidden talents, and, <laughs> and they and they really are hidden talents because I yeah. listen to faithful listen to the podcast, your Thank podcast, you. and Thank all you. those intros and all those beats and everything you yeah. do. Yeah. What in yeah, a hobby? Stuff. Thank besides you. Besides that, inspires you. Listen, what inspires me is this: it's the people, it's the relationships. Don't get me wrong; I love the cards and I love collecting the thrill of the hunt, all of that. But, dude, once I started realizing I was doing this on my own and once I was able to twist Tony's arm and have him join me and then our bond started growing that way because we obviously were family. I'm four years older than him. I'm 47 now. He's 43. And we've known each other our whole lives. But we, we've we like this last, you know, couple years, we're closer than we've ever been, like literally all day texting back and forth. It, it's insane. And then obviously we're on podcasts and we'll record for two hours and then we'll stop, you know, hit the record button. And then after that, another two hours, it's 1230, almost one o'clock at night. And I'm like, bro, you know, our wives are going to kill us if we don't get get upstairs, you know, real quick. So it's just amazing how that relationship between Tony and I, which I wouldn't say was strained, but it wasn't anything. You know, we were family, but it wasn't like we were going out, hanging out or anything like that. And now it's like we're inseparable. So it's unbelievable what the hobby has done for that. And then to have this, to be invited by uh, Rob and and, and Ken and you guys were all in here before we were. Um, So to get that invite from Rob, I thought was super dope. And it was like, man, you know, people are noticing what we're doing. And and we didn't get into it to, to like you know, be noticed and things like that. We just got into it and started messing around because we loved, like I said, that the passion for, for what we were doing, it was, it was just unbelievable. And then the first couple of times we started getting feedback from people that were listening to our pods and we would drop on a Monday and then Monday afternoon, Tony's like, yo, I'm getting all these messages from people. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta and he'll send me a little, you know, screenshot and I'll read it and I'll be at, at work. And I'm like, man, this is amazing. This is crazy. And it's like, you almost get like goosebumps that people are at one, they're actually listening to what you're saying and then being entertained and then having enough to go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to send, shoot these guys a message because I really felt what they were doing. And it just, you know, it, it warms your heart. And like I said, for a long time, I just, I, I wouldn't say I felt empty inside because I have beautiful family, beautiful wife, two, you know, beautiful daughters, one that just got married. I'm ready to be a grandfather, but you know, like you mentioned, Carmine, and I, I want to shout you out because I, I heard you said you kind of had like a little man crush on me. But, <laughs> but Carmine, you had me at you had me at hello, brother. You know what I mean? Like I, that's reciprocated. You know what I'm saying? So um, I love all you guys, and just like I said, there was just one little part of me that kind of was like not being fulfilled. And now to be able to go ahead and produce this content, collect these cars establish these relationships with you know with, with people across and it's not just dude it's across the world i get messages oh, yeah. from people i'm sure all you guys philippines yeah. you know korea uh you know 
all the way in Alaska. Like crazy. I'm like, what? What is this is insane, you know? And it it's just amazing what this has done for me. And uh, it's it's basically, you know, it's rejuvenated me in a way where that monotony of doing the same thing over and over again, I'm able to now just like I said, have a little pep in my step while I'm working because of this. Yeah. And yeah. And, and where else, like for someone like me to come out and hang out with guys like you, right? I mean, it, it, when we, I was doing, a, we were doing a podcast with Rob, I think it was this hundred episode with Craig and, and we we're looking at the screen and there was three, it felt like three generations right <laughs> yeah. there, you know, on the thing, not, not, I mean, poor me being the old guy. Right. But, but, <laughs> but really it was, it, you know, for me to be able to go hang out and, and, and be accepted by the community, by you know, young kids all the way up, you know, it, it's, it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. The hobby, it's so accepting. And, and yeah, I, I felt like I found my place. And Ken, talk to me about how, how does your wife see all of this? You know, like what, what is she saying? I know she's supportive of you, but can yeah. she believe exactly how far this is going? N no, no. And yes, <laughs> no. And yes, because she knows me to be, uh, and I don't, I don't know the easy way to say this without, you know, not saying it right, but she knows me to, to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, just Go about bra every, dude, dude, brag a little bit. There's just no about everything no. I've done in my life. I've been very successful. Nothing wrong with um, that. Uh, <laughs> and so when I, when I say to her, I'm going, I'm going to do this. You know, when I started doing this, she was like, Oh, good. You know, that's great. And I think she knew, you know, that it, it was, if I stayed with it, it, I would become successful in it. And it's just my nature to take, I'll take the L's. I don't mind taking the L's because to me, if you learn from those L's, you know, they're actually W's, right? They, to me, they're W's. So, so when I, I, I don't mind taking L's to, to figure out the proper way that's going to make me successful in anything I do. And, and, and I, and I've done it here in the hobby and I keep doing it. The funny thing about the hobby is it just, there's, there's so many, so many layers and so many steps in the hobby, right? There's not just like, it's not like saying, I'm going to open up this business and I'm going to, you know, sell my, my goods to these people, you know, it's completely different because there's so many layers uh, mm -hmm. in the hobby. So, so getting back to your question, I think she knew I'd be successful and it's, and she's very understanding about, you know, all the shows I do. I'll give her the list of shows I'm going to do and we'll write them on the calendar and, you know, we work around it. And, and nice. yeah, I mean, it, it, what do they say behind every great, great man is a great woman, right? I really owe a lot to her because Everything I do here, believe it or not, in, in my content creation, I'm always bouncing off of her, always bouncing off of her. And she's always giving me such great advice. Yeah, um, I, I heard the one time you say you guys go out for walks and listen to the actual yep. pod together. Yep. Oh, <laughs> nice. I mean, every when I record. As soon as, I, as soon as I'm done recording, whether it's an interview or it's my solo podcast, I download it to my computer and I email it to her. I, and then I know she's, we, we're going to go walking because we walk <laughs> four miles a day and, wow. and it's an hour, right? It takes us an hour to walk four miles and we listen to it. So nice. yeah, and, and I get great feedback before it ever even hits the air. Look at that. That's yeah. wonderful. I love Good that. Stuff. I love that. All right. Anything else you guys wanted to add to that before we move on? Uh, well, I agree with, uh, I think in what you said, Oz, too, about jumping into it and pressing record and just setting up the podcast and not knowing what you're getting into, but knowing that you have a passion and energy and an excitement behind it. And knowing that, like Ken just said so well, which is a, a sports card lesson like his podcast, but it's also a lesson for life as well. Like mm -hmm. I was telling my girlfriend, that I missed a potential game winning shot in pickup here in Medford, Oregon the other day. And I'm like, oh, I was like, it was a perfect setup for three. I felt good. I held the follow through and I just came up short and she's like, oh, that's thing. and I'm like, but you know what? I was excited to take that shot. And, and all these guys, you know, even the guys behind Ken with Tom Brady and Ovechkin and Mahomes have missed game winning shots, have failed on game winning drives but they're not afraid to continue to try and do that again. Or, you know, like, like Dave, if you take a loss on a card, you know, you're not afraid to reinvest that into the hobby and try to win the next time. 
I mean, look yep. at the poster behind you. That you know that that's the the biggest comeback in Super Bowl history. Yeah. You know, and 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 Tom Brady's the number one guy as far as not being afraid to rally the troops. And even though we're behind, we're we're still going to keep trying to make it happen. It might not happen, but it when it does happen, after all the times of it sometimes not happening, the reward is something like this. You know, and it's like just just jumping into it. And uh, I just thought that was great what you guys said there, and and not being afraid and knowing. How about that confidence, knowing that you're going to be successful eventually. And not being afraid to say that, that's important too, because yeah. so many people are shy about, oh, you know, I didn't know, and it happened this way, and it was just luck, and I'm so lucky, and this and that. It's like, no, I thought I was going to be successful. I've had a track record of being successful, and, and I just tried it out. I thought that was great. And that's what we call in the business a segue, ladies and gentlemen, because it's leads perfectly right into the next topic and that's creating opportunities in the hobby by taking calculated risks to get that reward. Now Ken, this was something that I heard on your show with that you were discussing with Rob and I, I was like, man, it was very intriguing what was coming out of your mouth always dropping those lessons. Uh, you know, obviously staying true to your name. So talk about that, man, creating opportunities in the hobby because there's going to be times where you take those Ls like you said but by taking those L's, that's going to lead down the road to that W. So t yeah. talk about your process. Yeah. It, you know, and I just, I, I kind of touched on it a few minutes ago. Um, I don't care what you do. And I'll start off saying before I was, I've been successful in everything I've done, but I've taken a lot of L's along the way that taught me how to get, how to be the winner, right. How to get those mm -hmm. W's uh, and be successful. And, and I, you know, it probably takes a certain type of person, but it, but if you can, if you can create your own opportunities and know how to create opportunities, no matter what you do, um, you're going to be successful sooner or later, Carmine, that ball is going to drop. You take that three point shot. Do you get that opportunity to take that shot at the end of the game, the game winner sooner or later, it's going to drop. And then after that, they're all going to drop. Right. So it, when it comes to the hobby and, and right here next to my desk, I keep this here. And this is my reminder. It was one of my biggest blunders in the hobby. Right. And I keep it here to remind me. Right? <laughs> and at what, and um, let me tell you something, this card has been more famous than me <laughs> in this hobby. Right. But I'm just going to hold this up. I knew it was. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you can see what this is. Yeah. It's a Mac Jones. Rated rookie, and it's a PSA three. <laughs> you can see that it's a Ooh. PSA. I mean, this card looks great. There's no way it should be a three, but you know, that is a reminder. Um, and I think everybody's heard this story how I sent these cards off when they were three thousand dollars a card, and by the time they came back, they were less than a hundred dollars a card, Sheesh. right? And by the time they came back from PSA, and that was a very short amount of time. So these are the reminders that that you know. It stings a little, but it reminds you of that was a mistake, but I learned from that mistake. What did I learn? First of all, Dave, we talked about cleaning those cards, right? The, yeah. the most important thing, if you're going to send them in, make sure you clean those cards. You do everything you can. Just don't take it out of the say, wow, that's packed, pulled. I'm going to throw it in a thing and send it to PSA. It doesn't work that way because um, other people have touched that card somewhere along the line, right? Yeah. Um, so you want to... First, learn from those lessons, but two, create your own opportunities. So in the hobby, for me, like business, if I've purchased a card, any card, and I'm just going to give it, a, I purchased this card for $100, right? And now all of a sudden, this card is worth $65 or $60, right? So now I've lost $40, $35 or $40 on this card. Because the card's worth $60, somebody's really only going to want to pay me $50 or $45. So really, what have I lost? I've lost more, more than 50% on this card. But if I can sell this card for the $45 and invest it into another card that may be $100 a month from now or $150 two months from now, 
that would be creating an opportunity. Say, okay, I've taken this loss, I've sold this card for a loss, but I've taken that money and now I've created a new opportunity with that money to put into another card. I've used low numbers, but I but I'll be honest, and most of you knows I would know that I was kind of a big Mac Jones guy. Right. So I bought a lot of high end Mac Jones and I look at those cards and I know the values of those cards. I've lost 50, 60 percent. But this year, this this fall and at these shows, I've sold those cards and some of that money has gone into these cards you see sitting behind me. Right. So I've moved those cards and I've invested in something that could make me that money back down the road. So now a lot of people would be like, oh, I made that mistake. I'm not going to buy any more cards or, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to take a risk and do that. But if you don't take a risk in anything, wh where's the reward, right? And, and, and that, that is a big thing in the hobby, but it's really a big thing in life too. That's, that's a life lesson. That's a lesson that you, you can, you know, if you don't take risks, you're not going to get, it doesn't mean everybody has to take a risk. It doesn't mean everybody's built the way I am or, but the more risk you take, the more reward you could get, or it could go the other way too, right? You could have, you could take another L and learn something from that and kind of move forward from that. So, yeah. um, opportunity, creating your own opportunities, whether it's in life or in the hobby. I, I, I just think it's so important. And if you've done something and you've purchased a card and you've lost, it was a, it was a bad move. And Dave, I'm sure, you know, you've done, I'm sure you've been through this too. And we'll pass it to you oh, in yeah. a minute. You Many know, times, you yeah. learn from it. You say, man, I should have known. And next time I'm going to be a little bit more keener and I may do my homework a little more. And I may look look ahead or I may ask different people or, or find better information somewhere else to help me make a better decision. Yeah. Yep. Now, Dave, you're a teacher, but I heard you say yep. you want to do cards full time. So that's mm -hmm. taking a risk. Mm. You're willing to, to, to go all in brother. Talk yeah, about that. It's, uh, listen, um, not there yet. It's just, um, you know, the hobby is, is um, it's been great so far and um, something I really enjoy. And, you know, down the road, I, you know, that's not something that's going to happen overnight, but you know, 10, 15 years, um, maybe. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's kind of the mindset I have and, you know, trying to build what's uh, right now, a very small business into something bigger and bigger over the years. And, um, like Ken said, um, I, I do think taking losses is, uh, is important sometimes. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do, you know, you know what you're in the card for, but, um, I think, you know, using those funds, uh, towards something else, um, for me, especially a good raw card. If I take three losses on three cards and I use that for a, a good raw card that I then grade, um, I've then made all my money back and then some. So um, that's typically what I try to do with um, you know proceeds from losses, especially try to put it into a, a good raw card, then grade it, and then I uh, get the money back. Um, as far as you know, taking action in the hobby and taking risks i like um grading and then trading you know um let's say after grading something gems it's a two thousand dollar card um i like to trade down and um you know get some cash get three or four raw cards that you know equal around the value that i wanted grade those and then when that cycle keeps going um you know it's that that's been um i'd say the biggest key to my success deals like that um after grading trading uh, trading down usually um and then just you know kind of getting rewarded for the the margin that happened um from grading and, e and even trading up too it's um you know if if i have good margins on a lot of smaller cards trading up into something that might be uh, very sought after at that given show um i love that too just kind of getting the pulse of each show um just trying to gauge what are the who are the three or four most popular players today and usually you can, you can get a pretty good read of that within the first hour of the show um you know based on requests and stuff like that so i think for me it's taking else um like ken mentioned um and also just um not being afraid to deal away trade away a pretty big card um you know because the potential reward from that could be much greater than just the cash um that you might get. Yeah. And you know, Dave, Dave and I 
We were at uh, national last year. We're going to national this year. I mean, that's a risk. That's a risk. Yeah. I mean, that's a big, that's a big investment. You yeah, know, it's a big to, expense for sure. Yeah. And you're going out there and, and you got to think all, all these expenses, when you start selling at national, you need to sell a decent amount, right? Before, before you're in the green, you know, yeah, and before, yeah. before you're ahead. So, so even the little things like going to a show and paying for a table and setting up, you know, it, it's a risk. You, you, you know, you may go there and not sell a card all day. Yeah. 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 And sometimes expenses pile up, you know, and sometimes, um, you know, the payments are due for shows uh, well in advance and some, that adds up. And uh, so, yeah, that is definitely a risk too, in some sense. Yeah. So Carmine, you had a couple risks lately. I, I know you said something about some cards and a trade and I believe uh, it didn't go the way you wanted, you know, but eventually we're going to turn that upside down into a positive. But uh, talk about that situation, how you kind of like took an L for now. Yeah, I uh, I had a deal on Instagram for a Larry Bird one of one game used patch on card auto from Spectra, and uh, I basically long story short, thankfully I paid Venmo goods and services, but the uh, I think it was a kid, a high school age kid, because just by the way he was talking and and had a legit post up, like a lot of like sixty or so people had commented on it. Uh, turned out he wasn't legit in this instance. And so I never got the card that I paid almost $1,300 for. Mm -hmm. And um, did you so send I'm, a card? Did you send a I, card? I, I, sent, I sent two cards that I was into for a hundred bucks, but we valued around 200. So I'm out on those cards, which I didn't really care about, but I just cared about the loss of trust that I got a little bit, you know, a little ding in the hobby. And, uh, of course, the loss of almost $1,300 that I'm hoping to get back, which Venmo has gotten me my money back before for something like this. When I have all the screenshots and they haven't sent a receipt with tracking and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that comes back soon. Um, but that I was talking with Craig on Crosstown Cardboard, our, pod, our podcast, and just saying that that was a little bit of a roadblock that I got over in the hobby and it's disappointing, but at the end of the day, there's so many more great aspects of the hobby that, um, you know, that I'm willing to take a risk on. I would do the same thing again, you know, just because the potential of getting that card and the number of deals that I've done, which is in the hundreds now where there hasn't been any problems except for one other time, you know, if I've done 250 deals and I've had two headaches where I've had to file claims. I'm not going to let those two out of 250 sour me on the whole thing. So I'm willing to take that risk. And I've lost, you know, money on cards before, like this tiger behind me, this BGS 95 uh, SP authentic on card rookie auto of tiger numbered out of 274. And I traded cash and trade with Dave, the other Dave uh, at <laughs> extraordinary cards. And that was a big risk for me because it was 3,500 of cards and 3,600 of cash. It was by far the most I've ever put into a card. But I'm like, you know what? I evaluated it. Okay, this is a GOAT. This is a rookie auto. It's in a great grade. It's something that doesn't come up very often. And even though it lost a lot of value since then, which I'm hoping it regains that value, it's something that I really enjoy and I'm willing to have taken that risk. So... I still feel good about it, even though the reward hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. But there's a potential when golf season heats back up. I've already seen his prices going back up. Mm -hmm. And and it and it mentally, kind of like how you said, Oz, it reinvigorates you to be back in the hobby. It gave me such a belief in myself that, wow, I was able to put seven grand <laughs> into a sports card <laughs> and have the balls to feel okay about doing that, that it gave me a level of, self-belief that I'm like, Oh man, you know, good for me. And so I, I never thought that I'd get that just getting back into cards, um, you know, about a couple of years ago, but it really has given me a self-belief um, that I never thought that would be coming from a hobby. Yeah. I mean, all, all the cars that you're collecting Carmine are ridiculous. First of all, I mean, that tiger woods is insane. 
That's something that I, I've been wanting to get for the longest time. A Tiger Auto, you know, rookie. I have his regular rookie card that everybody and their mom has, but yeah. that one is just beautiful. It's awesome. And yes, definitely that's going to get its value back. Trust me. And then some. It's just a matter of time. Um, like you said, it could be next golf season or it could be a couple of years from now. But regardless, Tiger is the GOAT when it comes to, to golf. And that's hands down. So I, I wouldn't worry about that card. You're going to you're going to get uh, your value back on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just talking about creating opportunities, Th this right here, what we're doing is creating opportunities going out of our comfort yeah. zones. It's easy. It can, yeah. it, you know, it's easy to just so go ahead, go to shows, buy some cards, you know, or you could just set up as a dealer and you sell a couple cards, make a little profit, go home and that's it. What we've decided to do was take this to the next level. Let's go ahead. You know, let's get some microphones. Let, let's buy some equipment. Let's go ahead and make productions and, and create content and do all this and sometimes piss off our wives and our family or, or you know, even other friends because we're spending all this time doing this stuff. But at the end, the reward, like I, I getting back to the relationships and, and everything that goes along with it, it far outweighs all of that. And it, it's just, like I said, taking that step because for me, um, you know, I know Tony says different, but. I growing up, I was not able to do what I'm doing right now to be able to be in a social setting and to talk like this. It, it just wouldn't happen. I, I just I didn't have that self-confidence in me. And I always thought that nobody cared what I had to say. So it took years and years and it, it probably well into my my 20s before I was confident to just say, you know what, I just don't care anymore. You know, mm -hmm. you're either going to listen or you're not and but i'm not going to take it to heart but you know i'm just going to go ahead and express myself and my views and like i said either you like it or not but i'm i love me you know what i mean it was just that that you got to love yourself first before you can love others and it just you you come to that realization after a while 47 i just don't care i, I really don't so you know being on here you either gonna love my content or you're not but i'm doing it for me because it feels good and that's my, you know, risk. And, and the reward is just this right here, man. Mm. This this wolf pack, unbelievable, fellas. I'm, I'm so appreciative of just being here with you guys. And then, you know, the cards and everything else, that's just like the little spice on the top, yeah. which is uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing, man. Mm. And now everybody here has set up at shows, correct? And I know, Carmine, you're going to be setting up at shows soon. Is that Burbank? Yeah, Burbank, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about that, man. You know, like... Just like pre-show strategies, how you guys prepare to set up at a show, what it all entails, and, uh, you know, just little tricks of the trade that people may not know that have been a little, you know, skittish to go ahead and do that and just take that plunge. Because it can be intimidating. And not a lot of people know, like, yeah, you can go ahead and you can buy a table and you can set up. There's ways, you know, it's not forbidden. Some people think you got to get, like, fought, grandfathered into that. And it's, it's not allowed unless you, you know somebody who knows somebody. You know, pretty much if you got the loot, you can get a table somewhere unless you're going to the national. Then sometimes, yeah, yeah, that's the case. But for the most part, most shows you can go ahead and get a table. So, uh, Carmine, I'll start with you since you have this show upcoming. What, what's your strategy, man? Well, I feel like uh, it's almost like swimming. I feel like, you know, how you train, <laughs> you train, 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 go crazy, eat 8000 calories a day like Michael Phelps. And then you paper. You don't want to go in, you know. Like I just got this mail. I got a couple. Actually, my girlfriend dropped it off while we're talking here. Nice. And I got a card that I already pre-sold to Ken. That's why he's celebrating on the YouTube. <laughs> this, uh, Love it. Mike Love Tyson it. auto. Yeah, what? That's pretty funny. Yeah, wow. I bought it in a, in a lot of uh, cards that I wanted to get that I wanted to prepare for Burbank. But I bought them at least a week before so that I would have – the cards in hand in time to take to the show because the last thing i wanted was to have cash out there and not have the cards i, I want to be at full strength i want to have all my yeah. cash and then all my cards all together at the same time i don't want to have stuff in the mail and i got cash and i can't flip into something else if the opportunity comes so to prepare for the burbank show i got a lot of lakers stuff lebron stuff i got a magic johnson flawless patch auto um yeah, just like stuff that would be intriguing and basketball stuff because now football is, mm -hmm. unless you're an Eagles fan like Oz and Tony or a Chiefs <laughs> fan like Ken, most people are are moving their football. That, you know, that's because. topic number four, which we'll get into. But <laughs> right. that, that, that's for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, yeah. We have you guys on our podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think like 
trying to have all your cards if you're if you're frequently buying have your cards in hand in a in a amount of time that when you bought them the shipping was long enough for you to get them and then having cash that you want to you know move to to use to spend and then i think it just comes on, on down to i love what dave said in the first hour you can get the pulse of what people are looking for you just have to set up at shows and put yourself out there and try it you know if you have I mean, I mean, what's the cost as long as you have a little bit of uh, money that you can use as expendable or disposable income, you can set up at a local show, especially in your guys area in the Northeast for, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks, if that, you know, and then get a pulse of the hobby, see what people are liking, what price range are people going for. And, um, and then you'll know for the next time, you'll take that and learn from it. And you could go back and forth, try between pricing your cards or not pricing your cards and having conversations start that way by people asking you. But I think it, it comes down to, you know, trying to gauge what people might be interested in and what you'll be OK with keeping if it doesn't sell. And that's kind of like the risk and reward, too. Like you take a risk, but the reward, as Ken said before, is still having the card, even if it doesn't sell. So make sure you're buying things that you that you like that everybody says, but that you don't mind keeping. And then, and then being at full strength for the card show with your cards and your cash, you don't want stuff floating around in the mail where you can't make moves with it at the time of the show. So Dave, go ahead and uh, speak on this because this is, this is your forte. This is what you oh, do. Yeah. You know, you're, you're not so much in the content area, but you are doing these deals. You're, you're setting up like, what's your process, brother? Yeah, so um, when I'm setting up, I um, there's always the debate about whether or not to price the cards. I've actually had better luck uh, not pricing the cards. Really? And, um, yeah, yeah, oh. and I think I think the reason why is just because the slabs look nicer. It just looks sharper um, <laughs> without the, you know, without the uh, sticker on it. But um, yeah, I, I dabble with a little bit of both um, with pricing and not pricing. I feel like I've had better luck uh, not pricing. But with that, you have to do your homework prior. You know, just know all comps um you know know where um you want to start the negotiations at know where you'd be willing to settle on in terms of a price um so just knowing your number as well um if you opt not to uh put sticker prices uh on your cards is is one as carmine alluded to i think geography is huge um, if i'm doing a show in new york i know that's coming up i'm definitely going to have uh, some giant stuff or some yankees stuff i'm going to try to cater to um you know the home teams that you know, are uh, people, relevant. People actually buy giant stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had a feeling you, you might comment on that. Don't listen. <laughs> um, and then, for example, uh, the Card Vault show, which was at Foxwoods Casino, um, you know, more Boston crowd um, had a lot of Tatum stuff. I, I mean, Tatum is going to sell yeah. well it's anywhere gold. at this time, I would yeah. say. But, um, you know, just trying to cater to the geography and the home teams um, for where the show is closest to. So, Typically, I know what shows I'm going to be doing um, at least a few months in advance. Um, so I, I try to prepare in that way at least a couple weeks prior to try to make at least a few new pickups to have that um, inventory that kind of aligns with um, the geography. And then um, at shows, um, a comment I get a lot is, uh, you know, we just got here. We'll do a, uh, we'll, let's do a lap around first and we'll swing back. So. A lot of times that means they're not coming back. They're, you know, they're going to end up finding something else they like. So um, I try to close route. the deal right there. I'll, yeah, <laughs> I'll try, you know, I'll say, um, you know, let's make this a deal right now. I'd be willing to, you know, I drop it down five or 10%, try to close the deal oh. right there. And um, it doesn't always work. I'd say it works maybe one in five times, but you know, if I'm willing to give them a little stronger price to close the deal right there and then, um, you know, it, I think that's a good strategy sometimes too. And, it is dependent on the card. There are certain cards where I might not want to do that, but others I, you know, I'd have a little more flexibility on, especially if I graded them. Go back to grading again. Um, <laughs> offers a lot of flexibility to do things like that. You know, it's still yeah. um, sell it at 80% comps and I'm still making good money on it. So that's definitely the beauty of grading. Um, just offers those different flexibilities that can be, um, you know, used and helpful at shows. How, how many and showcases I, I do you normally have? Yeah. Uh, what would you say? So how many showcases do you normally have? I usually have two. Yep, two, two. showcases, then a value box with um, a couple gotcha. discounts uh, for lower end slabs. Yep. And also, like Carmen mentioned, um, bring some cash initially at the show is, 
is definitely a good strategy. So that way, um, so if you're able to, it's definitely a good strategy because you don't want to miss out on some good uh, partial deals, you know, part cash, a um, couple cars that you might not be into for a whole lot, um, you know, make a good deal for a better, more liquid card. If, if someone has something lower end that I have that they might PC, um, deals like that happen all the time. So um, I think having that cash initially at the start of the show is definitely um, good and, and very helpful uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I echo what Dave says. You know, I call that know the show, right? Know the show. So if I'm up at the Springfield show, I've got Mac Jones in my case. If I'm down in New Jersey, he's in the value box, right? Because so, <laughs> you know you know who's going to be You buying still got those Mac Jones, brother? Yeah, I still got them. And, there, and there's a few I'm putting aside. I'll, I'll, I'll hold out, you know, hold out a little longer, you know. Hey, you never know. Uh, you never know. Yeah. And, 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 you know, with me, uh, my evolution uh, of, of setting up at shows went from one case to two cases and a rack and wax and all this. I mean, I, 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 was, I was going in there with like a tractor trailer worth of stuff, <laughs> piling it all up. I was selling everything. If it wasn't nailed down at home, it was going on the table at a show, right? And, <laughs> and I've completely gone around. I've got one cart, two cases a value box, some dollar boxes. Uh, you know, it takes me like 10 minutes to load the car, you know, 10 minutes to get it off the car where it used to take like a half hour, 45 minutes. Um, and, and the one thing I've learned through all of this, and it's really gotten me to change, you know, what I put in my cases, uh, even more so lately is stuff that other people don't have low pop stuff, rare stuff, stuff that people are going to show up and say, oh, I like that card. Let me take a lap around because I want to see the other 65 cards that are identically to that in the room and see what every single person's got it priced at to get it at the absolute rock bottom price. Um, so I'm trying to get away from that. I'm trying to, you know, as I move cards that are just so common that everybody's got in their cases, I'm replacing them with you know, so, some just more rare cards. So when people show up, they're like, oh, wow, I've never even seen this card before. I'm like, oh, it worked, right? <laughs> I, it, it's perfect now. And that's, that's kind of the lane I'm trying to get in. And, and, and as far as preparation for a show, and, and, you know, Dave, you don't price your stuff. I do. But having the right price, and maybe I add this work to myself. Carmine, I know you do because I yeah. watched your video the last time you were at Burbank. But you need to know, you need, it's like the night before, right? And, you, and you've got to put the price because now you're looking up comps because tomorrow, that's when people are going to be standing at your table pulling up a comp and you want to know exactly what that comp is, you know, so that you're spot on what your price is. Because if you're too high on your prices, people will just walk by. If they, they look down and they'll say, oh, Brady Bowman Chrome BGS9. I know that's a $2,700 card. Oh, he's got it at $4,000. Okay, I I'm moving along. You know, I'm just going to move on to the next because I'm I'm going to think everything is overpriced, right? Yeah. So I try to price my stuff to keep people, to stop them, to say, oh, that's a good price. Is that what the going price is now? I say, that's what my price is. It's better than anyone in the room, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. feel like there's cards that show. It gets so excited for shows. Yeah. I feel like what I gained from what you two guys said too is Dave knows his rock bottom price. What do I think I should turn this card over for at the minimum? Like where's my limit where I can possibly let this card go that it makes sense. And then Ken too, from, from what you were saying, like having cards where it's a good price for that card. Like you might have cards where the comps, these are the comps, but it still seems high. You know, like it still seems like I, I don't know if people like on eBay is one thing. You got a million people looking at the card. Maybe somebody will pay that on eBay. But a card that initially you look at it and it seems like, oh, that seems like a good price that somebody would pay cash for. Or if it's not, you know, a good value cash wise, is this something that somebody would trade for? Like that Mahomes rated rookie behind you. That is so liquid that so many uh, people want that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's like a card that you can, that, you know, a lot of people will want, mm -hmm. whereas Mac Jones right now, unfortunately, maybe not as much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're missing and that you know, Jalen Hurts, man. One other thing, 
One other thing I do at a show too, Dave, I don't know if you do. I've started telling people now to be like, oh, look, the last comp was $800, say. And I'll, and mm-hmm. I'll say to them, can you buy that card right now for $800 on eBay? Like, can you buy that card right now for like, is there a buy it now for seven ninety nine or eight twenty five or whatever? Because that's, mm-hmm. that's what, you know, this is the price that I'm selling the card at. And I think it's a fair price. And that comp may have been from two weeks ago or a month ago, like my Jalen hurts, red wave rookie number to one auto for one forty nine. You I mean, there's only 149 of these cards, right? Yeah. And, and how many are PSA nine like mine? And people will come up and say, well, December, there was the last one was $811. Well, he's going to the Super Bowl now. Yeah. And, there, and there are right. only other three yeah. on eBay you can't touch for less than $1,200, right? So right. all of a sudden, I think my $1,100, $1,200 price is a good price on a card like that. So, Yeah, yeah. I think in situations like that, we it brings out the teacher in us. You know, it's um, kind of our job to explain sometimes to the buyer that, hey, you know, that, that comp was – six weeks ago and since then Jalen Hurts for example is you know look what he's done in the playoffs if there's only one comp and it's a couple months ago or three four months ago um you know I think at that time it's wise for us to cite you know maybe a card that's numbered higher and has sold for more than that lower number card did three months ago I think just you know citing things like that so um you know um it, it just brings out the teacher in us and it gives us an opportunity to say hey you know things change and you know this is probably a better illustration um you know for the value of that card at the given time yep and as a dealer too you know i you know i'm buying the hertz rookie i'm buying the mahomes rookie you know i'm buying these cards in 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 august right because i'm thinking to myself who's got the best opportunity to go to the super bowl this year or even do well in the playoffs you know, and, and those, mm-hmm. those risk reward, we talk about it. We talked about earlier opportunities. Like there, there are other cards I purchased too. You know, my Joe Burrows, he, he didn't get there. Right. So now he's a great quarterback. So now these cards, that was my risk. They go into the closet. Right. And now they'll come back out in June or July. Cause I'm not going to take, you know, there's no, no need to take an L on them. So some of this, some of in this hobby, you know, you, we're making decisions three, four, five months in advance looking forward. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And showing that discipline too, I feel like is important. Like I've seen so many football cards in either on Instagram or in our sports card groups on Facebook where I'm like, ah, that's great. Beautiful card. I love it. Seems like a good value, but will that be cheaper in a month or two? You know, like I don't want to get a Hertz it- or a Mahomes or a, you know, Dak Prescott or whoever was recently in the playoffs, even though it's a great card, it's a good buy right now, mm-hmm. but it's going to probably go down in a month or two. So maybe it, wait for it the smart It depends on who it is. It depends on who it is. And now, uh, it, you, you know, you're going to get a player like um, Trevor Lawrence, right, who got knocked out of the playoffs but played so well at the end of the year. His value is going up so high right now. So many people at the shows go. I was at a show last week. Everybody, you know, looking. Everyone wants to buy a Trevor Lawrence card because they're thinking, I'm going to buy that card because next year he's going to do so much better. Yeah, right? and but, you have the same. It's like the dichotomy because now you have Dak Prescott who won the same first round of the playoff and then he got to the second you know, round and lost. And the trajectory of Trevor Lawrence is up. Now yeah. Dak is down. It's so, aged. and I know, unfortunately, Karma. I don't mean to, you know, harp on that, but uh, did you ever get paid on that one? <laughs> no, that was another uh, another risk reward. I guess it wasn't really that much of a risk, but I, I listed it on eBay. This Dak Prescott contenders rookie ticket auto in a BGS nine five to to sell for the auction to end right after the. Uh, the game with uh, the 49ers and the Cowboys an hour after sold for 610, which was about what I had into it. I had like 550 into it. And then the guy didn't pay on eBay. The so, loss. But, you know, I mean, it's still one of the best cards of a guy like Ken yeah. said, if you're, if you're holding, you know, and the national comes around and people are reinterested in football and they think the Cowboys have a shot again, which even yeah. though unfortunately it's proven they haven't had that great of a shot through the course of the recent history. But, you know, I mean, I'm still willing to take that risk and I'm not into it for that much. So I still feel if, pretty if good. If they it. won that game, he would have paid. 
or she would have paid. Yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah. yeah. And probably would have gone for more. You know, right. probably would have gone yeah. for more too. Right. I mean, you could have easily like just after the when they beat the Bucks, you could have just put it up for a buy it now, and you probably would have gotten more. But you wanted to get that little bit more. You know, your boy said, "Why don't you do it?" Because <laughs> if he wins. <laughs> Just imagine how much more you're gonna make. Yeah, you know, it's almost it, it, it's risk reward. You know what I mean? So, you know that, and that's the hobby, man. That's the beauty of it. And you never know what it's gonna end up being. But if you constantly just keep going out there and and doing those things and and believe in it you're going to get more w's than l's hopefully if you <laughs> if you're if you're doing the proper due diligence with it um with that said gentlemen we're over an hour we said we we're going to wrap it up right around here i want to say this was very fun it was educational i had a great time i think everyone here did we'll just go around real quick just uh closing comments i'll start with you ken uh, yeah, this was great. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Um, I enjoyed the conversation. And what I liked the most, that four different opinions, four different views, uh, four different lanes in the hobby, even though we do, we all do podcasting, right? Three of us set up at shows, four of us collect, but we all have different views. Like we see it differently and and we can talk about it. And And I just think that's, uh, the key part of all this this content that we're putting together for the Wolf Pack, um, that even though we're doing the same thing, we can all talk about it, and, and it all sounds much differently. Dave, yeah, and to add to that, um, it's been a blast tonight talking with you guys. Uh, you know, shooting the breeze for the past uh, hour, it's been great. And um, yeah, like Ken said. Um, you know, there's so many opportunities in the hobby. Um, I think we all have different angles and that's what makes the hobby so great. It's unique in that sense that, you know, we could, there could be 20, um, you know, different people out there and every, you know, there could be 20 different um, ways about doing things. Um, everybody has their own unique uh, lane when it comes to the, the hobby. We have some parallels and similarities, but, um, you know, we do have our own unique uh, way of going about things, which I think is very cool. And um, yeah, just to, to again speak about the connections made here with the wolf pack uh friends from afar my friend drew who i spoke about in tampa um the hobby is is um it's really been a blessing and it's been great in uh, many ways so yeah that would be the the main point i wanted to stress um everybody's in it just keep doing what you're doing and try to keep building on um on what you've done so far and, and have fun in the process mr jamay yeah i just think it's it's great that we were able to come together and talk about this and have fun and unite as a wolf pack and just have uh, an avenue where we can have that childlike friendship uh you know that's pretty rare I, I talked about this on ken's podcast uh just you know there's not that many avenues that you can find especially i'm learning getting deeper into adulthood almost 30 now that uh that will really fire you up you know give you that passion give you the you know and and cousin Tony back with another episode. You know, I mean that that that's the excitement. You know, as Oz introduces on Cousins Collectibles, that is rare to find that a lot of people out there don't have. You know, I mean, it's just a great thing that I feel like no matter what, if you're giving us a try, you know, listening to the podcast and just one listen and sports cards aren't really your jam, but just finding something that you have that passion, that excitement, because there's so many things that will be, you know, bills or uh, headaches or things that you go through during your daily life that having this outlet is so cool. And then you can even make deals like I'm sending this Mike Tyson to our boy Ken Ooh. for uh, this this auto, this uh, yeah, UD all-time greats, Mike Tyson. Great card. And uh, Ken shot me a fair offer, and I just accepted because that's the Wolf Pack. So it's uh, – it was a nice connection that we made. And now, you know, and now we can uh, even do business. So we got a friendship and a business at the same yeah. time. Ken smiling from ear to ear and cousin telling yeah. me jealous as hell. I can't wait for that <laughs> one. <laughs> well, that's it, gentlemen, man. I, like I said, this was, this was fun. It's late night, but it, it doesn't matter. You know, when we're talking cards and we're talking about the passion and everything that goes behind it, we could be here for hours. We could probably go for another two, but I don't think, uh, you know, Uncle Rob would allow that. So we're just going <laughs> to go ahead and end it like that. And it's Wolfpack, baby. Wolfpack to the moon. Appreciate you guys. Have a good night. Take care, guys. Appreciate you guys. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>